Um, Andy Ayim, um, as you can see, I was born black and I was born a man. <laughs> I know choice of my own here in London. Um, and for the last decade, I've worked as really a business builder across startups, scale ups, and enterprise. So I started off my career for my sins as a management consultant for Anthony Young. Um, then went to a really small consultancy called Elixir, and ended up working across Africa, South Africa, Namibia. Sounds like a backpacking trip, really. <laughs> um, then went over to, to San Francisco and Silicon Valley to build their innovation business from scratch, where we worked with leading VCs over there, Greylock Partners, Andreessen Horowitz, um, Lightspeed Ventures, and connected their portfolio companies to corporates out in Africa and in the UK. And that's just turned into a really big business for them. Then I joined another company called World First, where I worked in their product, well, we built their product team from scratch out in London, Shenzhen, and in Hong Kong. Um, and they got acquired this year by Ant Financial for 700 million. Some people did really well out of there, mm. not me. <laughs> um, and then I, I, I moved to um, Entrepreneur First, which is Europe's leading accelerator program. Um, and then finally, I'm, I'm here at Backstage Capital, where we invest in women, LGBT, and people of color. Um, so at least one member of the co-founding team has to meet that criteria. And we've made 100 investments today, deployed about 5 million uh, in total, and we're just about to run our Accelerate program in London, which is concurrently being run in Philadelphia, LA, and in Detroit. And I should know that. Yeah, so that's me, that's me in a nutshell. Helena. Hi, everyone. My name is Helena Murphy, and I am the co-founder of Raising Partners. My other co-founder is sitting at the back there. If you have any questions at any point, don't raise your hand. <laughs> so I have always been raising money, which when I say that out loud makes me sound like I've got a mental problem to constantly be raising investment. Um, but my journey started when I was 16. I ran a very successful eBay company, um, it then became a not so successful e-commerce company after I'd raised quite a considerable amount of investment. Um, I was competing with the likes of my wardrobe at the time, spent a lot of money on Google Ads and lost all of my cash. It was great. Um, <laughs> And I guess as a result of that, of that journey at the time, I was so stressed out as a founder trying to raise funds in a very short period of time, I lost all of my hair. It was a pretty nightmare um, situation for everyone, everyone involved. But what I had managed to do is, is get a return for, for my investors at the time and, and give them back their investment. And they sort of sat down with me and said, you know, you're really good at raising money. And you're also really good at creating an investment proposition and pitching a business and understanding what us as investors are looking for and how we can make money from, from a company and communicating that message. So I'm sure if you guys, any of you have raised money in the past, as soon as you have raised some capital, you become quite popular. People want to know how you did it, how you met your investors, where they can find them, what all the secrets are and tricks of the trade. So really... That's why we set up Raising Partners to kind of demystify the fundraising process for entrepreneurs and, and be that bridge and that spa safe space between entrepreneurs and investors. So on one side of the table, we work with investors, VCs, angel funds and help them find good quality deal flow and make that connection. And then on, primarily what we do is work with entrepreneurs and founders um, we're sector agnostic, so a huge range of different kinds of businesses, all at various different stages, um, to help them execute on a funding round. Hi, I'm Kasia. Um, my background is in mathematics and cognitive science. Uh, I've spent quite a few years in academia, and then I left academia to, to really uh, find out how all this knowledge can be used in, in real life situations. Uh, so I realized that it's, it's most of, most of the time it's not, and corporations don't really have access to uh, the latest research, especially when it comes to cognitive science, uh, decision science, and then AI-related topics. So uh, I co-founded a company called Brainpool AI. Uh, we are a network of over 300 top-level AI experts. Um, so these are AI, machine learning, data science, computer science experts coming from UCL, Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, MIT, Stanford, NYU, so some of the best hubs in the world. Um, and what we do is really we try to give access to this top-level AI expertise uh, and the cutting-edge machine learning solutions for corporations. So we do that in the form of either consulting or providing access to our experts on a project basis. That's pretty much it. Thank you. Awesome.
Uh, hello, my name is Alejandro. I am the chief scientist at this uh, organization called the Institute for Ethical AI and Machine Learning. Uh, we're focusing primarily on developing industry frameworks and open source tools that ensure the responsible development of machine learning uh, in production. Um, my background is primarily as a practitioner. So before this, I was leading a machine learning department at a legal tech uh, company. Uh, we were building systems that were uh, uh, automating uh, regulatory uh, um, compliance at scale, uh, working with uh, global investment banks, insurance companies, etc. And the work that we do now uh, also reflects uh, case studies of what uh, I've seen, all of the uh, 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 scary stories, uh, including things uh, such as bias when automating processes such as recruitment or uh, insurance uh, uh, um, processes like loan approval uh, automation. And um, yeah, I'm quite excited to dive into this. Mm. I think kicking right off the bat, Andy, um, will VC investment ever be fair? Before I answer this, um, I would hope that no one today references this McKinsey report that was published years ago about how diverse teams outperform non-diverse teams. I think it's common sense, and I think we should just table stakes that now and get that out of the way. Will VC ever be fair? So for me, honestly, I don't think so. Not at the pace that we're operating at now and the pace that we're moving at now. Because actually, the, at the root of the problem, and I think everyone's going to touch on this in some shape or form, we'll see. Um, at the root of the problem here is that it's a behavioral issue and it's a, it's a mentality issue. And when you're a child, right, you're like clay and you're wet and you're moldable and you can literally be shaped into whatever your primary and secondary influences are. Basically, your friends and your parents with a little bit of school. But when you're an adult, you're really molded and you're hard and you're set. And it's really hard to break that mold and remold you. And the problem is, all of these biases that we've grown, grown up with, these habits that we formed, and these opinions that we have end up shaping our view on the world. And when we have things in organizations such as referral networks, can you go and refer a friend to come and work here? It's very likely your friend is quite similar to you. And it doesn't mean that everyone that's white and middle class and a man has friends that are white, middle class, and men. But a lot of them may be. And if we're going to do that, then we're not going to actually get out of those networks and recruit people that look different to us. And that's what's happening in VC right now. If you look at leadership teams, a lot of the time on websites, it's shocking to just see all white, middle class men. And oh, there are a few ladies on their site, and they're PAs. And there's definitely no black people on the site, let alone. And is that right? Is that, is that building products for us all? Is that building products that's inclusive of the society that we're living in? No. So the real truth is we need to get leadership to look a lot more like society does, and we need those people to be building the products and services of the future because they're reflective of the society they're building for. So do I think it's going to get fairer? Not for a long time until we really start changing that and stop paying lip service to just DNI as a comm strategy, which is what's happening today. Mm. Helena, what do you think? I mean, I, yeah, I completely agree, and I think the, the challenge is, is that people do kind of get up almost hook onto that as a PR story, isn't it? And bang that drum of this isn't fair, this isn't fair. We know that. It's very clear that it's not. It, yeah, like you said, you look at a website and, and that's not a representation of society or the people that are in the room pitching for, for investment. But we've got to play with what we've got. And that's not going to change until, like you just alluded to, fundamentally children come through and, and get those jobs and people get recruited into those positions. So that's one thing in terms of, and I'm sure we'll touch on it later, on the things we can do to improve the situation. Mm -hmm. But right now, where we're at in 2019 is, is what we've got. And if you're a founder pitching for investment, then I don't think the focus should ever be on, well, I'm from this minority group or I'm female, so therefore it's not fair for me and... and Okay, it might not be fair for you, but we are where we are and we need to, what we can do is try our best to present an investment proposition to investors that they understand and they can resonate with and, and in a way that they're used to receiving something. So focusing on an investment proposition rather than necessarily who you are as a founder and saying, well, I need to do this because I'm a female founder. Um, so I think, yeah, it's not, it's not fair. It's not going to be fair for a really long time. We are where we are. I, mean, I guess if I'm uh, in the audience listening, I think we accept that things are unfair. But what specifically could I do if I'm from an underrepresented group to access funding? So let's say life isn't fair. I think we both accept. I think we all three of us accept that. 
What, what can you offer to the audience in terms of guidance of what's next? Uh, can, can I jump in and add? Yeah, one please thing? do. So um, I think one thing is that you don't suffer from that investor, um, in that, that imposter syndrome, where you're saying, actually, I'm going to disqualify myself from this opportunity. I'm not even going to go and apply for funding. I'm not even going to go and apply for that job. I've been there and I've done that. We shouldn't be doing that. OK, that's number one. Um, the second thing that we can do, actually, is like, do a bit of homework and research. Like, the strongest founders that are coming to me, regardless of their background, understand like the themes I'm interested in, my background, what I've invested in in the past. They tell a story that articulates that they really understand what this investor is looking for. And if you don't understand that, attend their events, attend their office hours, read their research, read their publications, watch their videos on YouTube, listen to their interviews on podcasts. In this day of the internet that we have now, information has never been so readily available. It's actually the best time to be able to do due diligence as a founder to find out actually who's your fit. And actually, if you see an all-white male middle-class team that you don't agree with and you don't, doesn't appeal to you, don't go to them for funding. It's your choice as well, because you're about to make them a lot of money if you succeed. And we have to think about that. It's, it's, it's a marriage. It takes two. It's not a one-sided thing. And we need to acknowledge that and understand that before we choose whether this is the path that we want to go down. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think on that part of, of it's a marriage with investors, that is one of the, I think, as founders, taking your time to do that and not rushing into any kind of decision on investment and what's best for you and where's best to go because there isn't a one-size-fits-all brush mm. of raising money. Oh, Series A, Series B, whatever we're at, it's, it's, it's not like that. And you're making such important decisions as founders that you've got to live with for the rest of your life and getting out of a relationship with investor is actually more difficult than getting out of a Absolutely. traditional marriage. So it's got to be right on, on both sides of the table. Absolutely. And, and, and it's really about understanding like intricacies such as like, where is that fund on its life cycle? If that fund mm -hmm. raised 10 years ago and it's five years in, they need to desperately make a return within the next two or three years. And when we talk about fund returners, there are companies that can return between 3x to 10x of what their investment is. So if you go in at that stage, there's a huge amount of pressure on you to return funds in that short period of time. And suddenly, it could take you off course because the incentives are not aligned with your goals and your milestones. And are you willing to go into that arrangement? And it's really important to understand that before you enter these kind of, these kind of things. Mm -hmm. I guess looking at the other side of the pillar, um, in the news, certainly most people have uh, heard about the disaster of the Boeing 737 MAX. And I know you were in Rome uh, last week at the, the European Committee uh, conference where they, this came up. So I guess maybe the question is, is to you just on that other side, the other pillar of this event. So will algorithms ever be fair, Alarondo? Yeah, no, that's, that's a very good question and, and uh, really interesting insight. I'm actually learning a lot uh, on, on the investment side. Uh, the challenge with, with algorithms is that they will, especially uh, um, statistical models that learn from data, they do basically that. They learn from the data that you give them. And what that means is that if the initial uh, context that is provided to these algorithms is it carries an inherent societal bias, the algorithm will learn how to optimize for that specific uh, bias. Uh, ultimately, there, there is a misconception that it, it needs to be the case that bias is removed from algorithms. And today I want to demystify that by just saying that it's impossible to remove bias from algorithms. What is possible is to remove a uh, reasonable level of uh, undesired biases. And that can be done by introducing the right processes and having the right people with the right expertise, not just from the technical side, but also from the domain expertise. If you're introducing a tool, say for example in investment, and you want to get more insights, whether it is from explanatory modeling or predictive modeling, to be able to increase profitability in your decisions, um, you, you, you will have biases. If you don't follow best practices, you are gonna end up having these biases, not only hurting your business, but also potentially causing a, uh, a disadvantage to society reinforcing that existing bias, right? The algorithms are going to tell you what is the best investment decision for today, but not potentially what is the investment decision that should be made in order for that to be viable in the near future. 
And I think that's why it's important. Algorithms themselves is not a question on whether they will be fair, because what, what does that even mean? Yeah. It's more of a question of what are the things that we can introduce to ensure that algorithms are being used in a responsible manner mm -hmm. with the right uh, experts, mm -hmm. right? And this is not just data scientists, these are people with investment backgrounds that can be and, and say, or potentially even like in some situations, ethics boards mm -hmm. with like the, the Boeing 7 uh, uh, um, um, uh, flight uh, uh, accident, you have standards because they ensure the, the sessions come across a level of scrutiny. So I think um, it's not possible to have fair algorithms, but it's possible to introduce fairness in the process. I think that would be my, my perspective. So Kasha, one of the um, examples that you brought up when we spoke earlier was around hedge funds and the applications yeah. of AI. I thought you might want to mention that as well. No, so I just I want to say like, I definitely agree with that. And there should definitely be a standardized way for data pre-processing because uh, biases often come out from the pure fact that the data sample that you're analyzing does not represent the actual audience you're trying mm -hmm. to draw conclusions on. Uh, so, so having that standardized process on data pre-processing is very important, but also understanding the power of confirmation bias. So what a lot of people do is have a statement, a ready-made statement in their head, or oh, th these kind of people act like this. And then they look for confirmation of their statement that they completely made up in the data. And oftentimes, you can find whatever you want in the data because it's you know, such a complex process of, of analysis. So definitely, that's one thing to look out for. And when it comes to um, trading, so um, algo trading became like a massive thing over the past few years. Uh, and only last year, hedge funds actually realized that they're really struggling with it because the returns uh, started getting lower than uh, the, of the hedge funds that are not using uh, algorithmic trading. Uh, solutions, um, and it's because we uh, we have to make sure that the algo trading or whatever algorithmic solutions we propose are acting in a mix with the human-made or human-led decisions. We can't just trust algorithms, especially when they, we don't fully understand how they work. And a lot of algorithms are acting in the black box kind of solutions that no one actually fully understands what is happening inside of the algorithm. So I think that combination of having the data and understanding it, but also looking at things uh, with the human kind of intuition and uh, human mind is, is very important. Mm. I think, again, I guess being an advocate for the, for the audience, if, if I'm maybe not in a group that's talked about here, so whether I'm not an LGBT founder, I'm not from a BME background or not a female, well, how do I intersect in this issue? So I guess the question is, how do organizations and individuals that represent overrepresented groups, how can they support a mission to both make algorithms fairer accepting they will never be fair, and the investment landscape fair, accepting that it will never be truly fair. Mm. I can yeah. take that for because uh, that's pretty much what BrainPool does. So mm. we built BrainPool with a perception or an idea that AI solutions, and especially the cutting edge research, should be available to everyone. Uh, it's really dangerous when one country or, one, uh, or bigger companies uh, take ownership um, of the whole AI landscape, because once you get advantage in AI development, that advantage becomes exponential over time to the level that humans can't really interfere with it at, at some point. So uh, I think uh, companies should really uh, recognize the importance of regulating the AI systems and solutions that they're building. Uh, and second of all, supporting companies like ours, for example, that actually has a mission of uh, making that uh, AI accessible to, to smaller companies as well. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Andy, when, when we spoke, you had quite a number of things to say on this topic. That's so pressure, isn't it? Yeah, I know. <laughs> You're in it now. Um, uh, so, so one thing I think is that like, it's really important to have allies. Like, when I talk about white middle class males, they're not enemies. Like, it's really important to have allies that can open doors, that are embracing this message and actually taking heed on it. And you know it's the difference because in these companies, they're weaving it into their code of conduct. You know, like at Backstage, for our values, it's diversity is strength, success for all, and it takes a village. And we invest, our mission is literally to invest in underrepresented founders. Like, it's meaningful to us. It's not by accident that all of our team is just a diverse team. It's probably one of the most diverse teams in venture capital. And it's a system by design. And we're seeing companies now starting to take steps in that direction. Because what you do is you ask who's not in the room. 
And either you do something silly like an Edward de Bono, let's wear a thinking hat, like if I was that person, mm. or you do the common sense thing, which is actually if there's not a woman in the room or someone disabled in the room, let me go and find someone that is and let me speak to them. Rather than having my assumptions, let me validate my assumptions by actually going to have a conversation with someone from that audience. So something that we've been experimenting with, for example, is office hours in urban areas. Like, let's go to Moss Side in Manchester. Let's go to Lewisham, to Peckham, to Tottenham. Let's host office hours on their doorstep rather than them feeling intimidated and coming to the city where we are. Why should everyone always come to us? We're not royalty. And we need to break down those barriers and just become a lot more accessible and there's a lot more actually that we can do to invest in the pipeline that we keep on talking about. This imaginary pipeline. Like, let's go into schools, let's go into STEM, STEM subjects, let's go and influence curriculum, let's go and influence, let's go and run these coding clubs. Like, we've got the money, we're venture capitalists, why are we not doing it? So I think there's a lot of lip service in this area, there's a lot of easy, practical things that we can do to take a step in that direction if we really want to. I'll leave it at that. You mentioned intersectionality. No. I did, I did. And intersectionality is a really important analytical <coughs> thing. And it's to say like, like I originate from Ghana, right? And I'm a man and I'm black, okay? If it's not evident already. And I'm not just one thing, right? Like I benefit from patriarchy. That's not my fault, but I do. And I have to try and use my privilege to address that inequality. But I've suffered sometimes from racism. You know, I grew up working class, but now I'm actually middle class. So I've suffered from classism, now I'm benefiting from it to some degree. But how am I using my privilege to address that inequality now that I'm aware of that? And that's something we can all ask in this room, and we should constantly be thinking about. How are we using our privilege to address the inequality? And it came, became really evident for me when I, when I was working in South Africa, and I visited Nelson Mandela, Mandela's house in Soweto, and I was talking to a lot of the kids there. And what I quickly realized was that, actually, they have high potential just like me but they have very low access to opportunity, whereas I have so much high access to opportunity just because I was born in London, not by my choice. And when you actually start stripping away at intersectionality, you start realizing there's so many layers to this, and it's actually a disservice and it's lazy to just talk about gender equality and women, which is a lot of what the press and the money's going to now, you know, the, 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 the pay gap. What about the ethnicity pay gap? What about disabled people, actually, that can't even access these WeWorks that we're building everywhere, or these workspaces, or actually these environments that we're building. You know, there's so much to it, but we're so lazy in our thought, because actually it doesn't really mean much to us yet. So we have to really want it, and we need to change our behaviors and how we think about this. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes as well, it almost comes a layer, a step back from that, where people might have these opinions and be thinking this on the inside, and they internalize it. They don't even actually vocalize their opinion mm. and acknowledge the fact, Absolutely. oh, there's a, there's a problem, and mm just to tag onto it, but I'm a white middle class male and I see that there's an issue here with all of these, and they may completely agree with it inside their heads, but they don't mm. even vocalize it to their friends, to their peers, and, and at best if they do, then it's to the press and it's in a very generic way that's like, oh, let me just dabble in this thing mm. over here, but not actually do anything like you were saying about it in terms of Absolutely. practical steps that people can take, like office hours in different locations or targeting specific different groups are just trying to break down that barrier of what traditional VC or investment is, which if you Google it, just generally looks like ivory towers in the city. And, and, and thankfully, for the most part, it's not really like that mm. when you get into it, but it can seem like that from the, out, from the outside. And, and the irony there is that like, the whole point of this asset class, venture capital, which is really small actually, 600 million was invested like last year across Europe in venture capital. And I say that's really small because if we look at private equity, it's 1.6 trillion. Like if we look at hedge funds, it's 3 trillion. So actually it's a really small industry when we look at financial services as a, as a whole. FX industry again in the trillions, like I'm saying 600 million here, right? And as an asset class, you're meant to be finding outliers. You're meant to be looking in different places for differentiated deal flow to find different deals that others are overlooking or not seeing. So by its actually de definition, you should be investing in diversity. It's to your advantage to, to look where others are not looking because that's where hopefully the returns are going to come from. So there's a really weird thing happening in this industry where we're being really lazy. And actually, for the most part, we're seeing very mediocre returns and poor returns, which is why actually not a lot of VCs are raising fund two, fund three. They're struggling. 
You know, so it's, it's the time to act different and do something different because the existing patterns are not even working. Helen, I have in my notes, uh, leave your uterus at home. What, what oh, yeah. Mean? Okay. So I am currently six months pregnant. And last week I had a conversation with some, some female founders on just generally what is your experience. And, and currently, right now, it's, it's very obvious that I am female and also pretty obvious that I'm pregnant. And I've, I've experienced even just over the last few weeks of people saying, I'm really worried about the fact that you're going to have a baby, where are you going to go, what you're going to do, where you're going to be, for, on both sides of the table, from entrepreneurs and from investors. And, and I was sharing this story with, with a couple of other female founders, and one of them was actually told when she was pregnant, pitching for investment, which is horrendous, that she should come back when she'd left her uterus at home. So, I, I mean, that's just a very real-life story of, of, of so how... Um, she'd been treated when she was when she was pitching for for venture capital, but I just thought, I mean, that's just horrendous, and we can all sit in this room and, and I can tell that story, and most people would sit there and be like, I can't actually believe that that is that's something that happened, and yeah, and it wasn't even that long ago, so mm. I just that's disgusting. Yeah, yeah. Good, good, Helen. <laughs> I think I think um, and that that does emphasise one of the points that we touched briefly, which is. Right now, we're, we're in an age where people want to introduce uh, uh, machine learning because it's a buzzword. Mm. But I think, moreover, just digitizing uh, their systems, whether it's like putting in the cloud or actually uh, introducing some level of automation. And one of the challenges is that if you were to take uh, a inter an internal process, say, for example, uh, we were chatting before, uh, recruitment, and you wanted to, um, again, use algorithms in order for, for you to optimize this existing process to get better results, in the candidates that you bring in, and even if it's an investment, in the investments that you make. Mm. The data sets that are currently available, if you train a machine learning model, it's not going to try to predict that the best investment will be on uh, women that are pregnant. Not because it's not the case that that hasn't shown, it's just the number of examples that you will be feeding your data set will most definitely not have a representation, a statistical representation, on the data set itself. And I think one of the biggest problems that occur with simple like machine learning problems or data problems is class imbalance, is having more examples of one than the other. Mm -hmm. And often that uh, passes under, uh, uh, without noticing. And the results that, that can have with that um, may be detrimental within the, pro the project itself, but also with the people that it's engaged with. So I think that's, that's why when it comes to um, this challenge of uh, algorithms. It's important to not try to uh, 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 hold the algorithms on a, on, a, on a moral level that is higher than humans, because I would even argue that humans are not even that high in that scale. So it's about understanding what does the industry require, and in the case of what we're currently doing is working towards building industry standards. So we're currently contributing to this uh, uh, project with the IEEE uh, on an algorithmic uh, 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 bias consideration standard. And what this allows you to do, like with a cyber security certification, is not for you to say, I'm never going to get a cyber attack. It's not for you to never have a bias. But it's to make sure that you're not going to be that big tech company that, that releases their, their recruitment automation process, which ended up re uh, rejecting CVs that had a gap, which ended up discriminating women that were in their maternity leave. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's what Amazon had with their high profile sort of uh, uh, incident. So I think that's why it's so important right now in this era of algorithms and digitization, in an era where we get recommendations on every single video that we watch on YouTube, that we understand what are the best practices and the, 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 the level of scrutiny that companies should be held accountable for when pushing something to production. Mm -hmm. Because right now, writing a line of code is not what it was many years ago. You know, one line of code can have a significant impact. And I think that's, that's one of the areas where algorithmic bias, the unsexy part, which is standards and best practices, doesn't sound as cool, but that's what we need, right? That, that's really what we need to introduce. And I, and I completely agree with what you said, is like, how do you make sure that we have standards for pre-processing, standards for uh, assessing and evaluating models, et cetera, et cetera. But, but yeah, that, that, that is my perspective of how these this sort of fundamental societal issues then translate into bad automations. Just on that Amazon example, and I think, Hasha, you mentioned uh, when we spoke earlier of actually the business case of using ethical 
AI tools. And actually, it seems to touch on that Amazon example where a product was launched and everyone was happy with how it went, but actually, there's both a brand uh, risk at the end of that road when that actually uh, that uh, product did not work. And now we use the Amazon example as what not to do. So I wonder if you wanted to talk a bit about that from your client perspective. Yeah, no, definitely. I actually want to just, if I can uh, yep. touch upon yeah, yeah. what uh, you said, because uh, I think uh, the basically having a st statistical um, significance in your data is one thing, but also making sure that you don't exclude data is very mm -hmm. important. Uh, and that actually causes a lot of biases when it comes to, for example, investment-led decisions. I know if you guys saw that uh, TED talk, it was done by ex-entrepreneur uh, who became a researcher, um, and she was analyzing the pitches made by female founders, yep. female entrepreneurs, um, and because obviously there is a big uh, discrepancy when it comes to investment amounts, right? Uh, she couldn't find any significant differences when it comes to pitches. Like they were all covering the main points, you know, mm -hmm. the, the kind mm -hmm. of financial aspects. Of it. But wh the, where the biggest different light was the questions that the investors were asking. Mm -hmm. So the male founders were asked questions that were guiding them on the path to success to talk about their successful journey, whereas female founders had to protect themselves and answer questions that were more guided towards how are you going to prevent disaster within your business. And that whole, uh, that, that spun their pitch towards a negative uh, kind of perception. So I think that, that's I also... That. That needs to watch that. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, that's interesting. So that's, uh, that's one thing. But when it comes to uh, actual case studies, we work with a lot of companies, some of them from the big four, Deloitte, EY, and... Uh, big banks uh, and, and so on. Um, I think it's, uh, for, for them it's, it's really important to actually uh, allocate time uh, and make the ethics of AI one of the priorities when it comes to deciding on, on what kind of AI, AI solutions to build. Uh, what's been happening a lot in the past is that a lot of companies uh, apply ready-made solutions or data scientists are you know, self-taught and just learn how to apply a few libraries in Python without actually understanding what these libraries are doing. So what we try to encourage uh, clients to do is actually, first of all, allocate resources and time to make sure that what, uh, whatever they're trying to build is ethically correct. And then obviously the pre-processing, the data biases, um, to avoid that. And then to actually um, employ uh, data scientists and researchers with an academic background who can understand the mathematics behind the machine learning code. Um, it's, it's, it's really important that you actually understand what the machine learning system is doing. There are so many uh, off-the-shelf uh, open source solutions at the moment that any of us could do or use, you know, just following simple instructions or maybe after a couple of days of training. Uh, but unless you really understand the background of what you're trying to build, uh, you will not be able to build a sustainable AI solution. And that's also what we're trying mm. to help with. Mm. Well, I think, I think, yeah, that emphasis on we need to convince people that they need to understand what they're doing, that's crazy, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah. like, people are, are literally just pushing stuff because they read a tutorial on, yeah, exactly. you know, I don't know, Medium, yeah. <laughs> putting it in production. That's crazy. I mean, people actually know fundamentally understanding what they're pushing in production. <coughs> I think that's what we need to really you know, push for. And, and there was this also this study that, that showed that it was like something like 40%, 60% of startups in Europe that say they have AI don't reflect yes. what their pitch decks yeah. say. Mm -hmm. And th this is so dangerous. I think that's one of the motivations why we're trying to create those standards. Because it's how do you protect the, 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 the people that, that Absolutely. shouldn't be expected to understand the algorithms themselves. So yeah, I, I completely agree, but it just blows my mind every single yes. time that I hear it. No, not many people actually understand what yeah, it's all yeah. about. <laughs> yeah. mm. Okay, so let's uh, talk about the third question. Um, I think we've uh, certainly, Andy and Helena, we've certainly articulated um, the difficulty represented in some of the VC community. But if I'm someone from that community or a, a private equity firm and, I'm, and I accept that there's a problem, what might you say to them in terms of specific solutions or tools that they can do to improve this landscape? So asked another way, if I'm from a VC firm, what can I do? To what Andy's doing. <laughs> <laughs> I think 
it's, it's a challenge because on, on one hand, I think female, and I'm speaking from a female perspective because that's the category that I fall into, in some ways, female accelerators can, in a way, are a good thing. But then also, mm. I'm a bit reluctant in the sense that are you then just segregating people more and saying, right, you're in this category versus mm. the men that are over here? So we've made this big deal of a, of a female-only accelerator or a program where we're only going to see pitches from, from women. But then I've, I feel like there should be more to just make it inclusive across the board rather than just focusing on one particular category. It's like, how can we level the playing field for, for everyone here and not put people into these boxes? And that's, I mean, that's the biggest challenge of all, isn't it? Like, like you were just saying all, around biases because they're already in, within people. So I think in terms of practicality of, of what people can do, I'm, I'm reluctant to say, run this accelerator, segregate these people mm. all up and, and do one specific thing because all you're doing then is, is just broadening out the problem, if that makes sense. And, and I think more practical things that you can do are getting, getting out and speaking to founders more and build, bridging that gap between what, what we see at Raising Partners is kind of entrepreneurs kind of over here and investors over here. And it doesn't really matter what diversity or, or background they're from is there's a fundamental big, almost like a big red sea in between what investors are looking for sometimes over here and, and entrepreneurs understanding what that is. And I think that's the, the mm. gap that we need to try and bridge is that communication between those two channels. And sometimes it's around diversity in different groups. And sometimes it's around this, you know, we're investors and this is actually what we're looking for. And this is what of, you know, this is the kind of return we're expecting. This is where we're at in our funding cycle. This is how you can approach us and what we can do. And this is the best way to get in touch with us. And, it, it, you know, it's so much more than just what initiatives can a VC have to open up deal flow from one, one group. It's yep. what can we be doing to open up opportunities from all groups of mm. entrepreneurs. And I saw um, it was sent to me an article in the Times. Uh, I believe you had met with the group of uh, Black UK. You're laughing, Black UK venture venture capitalists. Do you yeah. mind talking a bit about that experience? Yeah, and how sure, this sure. In? So, so 21 of my friends, uh, we just met for a breakfast in, in Soho. A picture was taken, to be honest, with no intention for it to blow up and go into the papers and stuff. It was just shared on Twitter as we do in this day and age. Um, and it was interesting in that there's around 7,000 investors here in the UK in VC um, in private equity and, and, and there's 21 in VC particularly that we know of that are black. Okay, and, and the Times brought this story around the fact that like, is this fair? Is this right? Why is this? How can we challenge this? And it's really interesting what you shared actually in this story in that a lot of it comes down to perspective, right? So we could on the one hand say, it's really biased and it's bad that we're segregating these people and, and creating a program for them because they're female. Or on the other hand, we could say, for the last 20 years, you've just been investing in white middle class men. So you've actually been running that kind of program yourself anyway. Yeah. And rather than me saying there should be a quota around, oh, we need to get, you know, 5% of leadership to be uh, from a BAME background and 15% to be women, Actually, maybe I should put a quote on how many white middle class men can be in leadership. And it's perspective again. Like, why should a quota be on me when actually you're the problem, the quota should be on you? And it's really interesting as humans how we like to, to bias for the positive, but actually when we think about it in terms of the inverse, it's really interesting. And I think that's what a lot of investors can do. Hmm. Think about the inverse. Like, how, come, how could it look like if we did create pathways into leadership for people that don't look like us. Because what does happen is, number one, I could just, let, let's go through like, like a literal customer journey. I could apply to Investor X and see that there's no one on leadership that looks like me. Actually, there's no one in any team that looks like me. Actually, I don't want to apply anymore. Scenario one. Scenario two, I apply, I get interviewed, I get in, and I don't feel like home. I feel like I'm 60% of myself in this environment, so I quit. So there's a retention problem. That's scenario two. Scenario three is actually, they don't even care. 
because I'm getting a good return and we're a profitable company and I don't know the opportunity cost of what it looks like if I had diverse people in my team. And this is why I say it stems back to a behavior and a mentality thing. Like I could have these conversations all day and it would actually bore me until I see action being taken. And I'd rather like a VC or an investor came to me and said, look, I'm doing this thing in Leeds or in Liverpool and I'm taking action and I'm going to this church to recruit and I need help. Yeah, let's go. Like, let me roll up my sleeves. Let's go. Let's go and do something practical. But if you just want to sit and have this conversation, then we're not going to really move the dial that much. You know, mm. so, yeah. It would be interesting to get some questions from the audience. Yeah, so well, let's, let's, let's uh, move on to, I guess, uh, one of the last, what is, who are the last two questions to see if we can get some audience interaction. I hope everyone has saved up a range of questions that they can ask. Um, so the fourth question, um, and I think, Kashi, when, when we spoke, I think you mentioned the Apple ID face recognition example. So this is about uh, business leaders um, from tech firms. Um, if I'm a business leader from a tech firm, how do I seek to ensure societal biases uh, aren't, isn't replicated in some of the work that I'm doing or the, the code that I'm building as an organization? Yeah, so I mean, it's, I think we've mentioned it quite a few times, Alejandro, especially uh, before. So you probably all know that uh, uh, Apple Face ID and other facial recognition uh, systems uh, tend to work better on white faces purely due to the amount of data that. that uh, that I trained, trained on. So it's the same point as I was making before. You need to make sure uh, that the data you upload into a machine vision system uh, represents the sample that you're actually going to apply it to. You can't have a, you know 99% white faces and then hope that it's going to work on a, a, another color face. So um, I think it's, it's really important that uh, companies implement once again the regulation in the, the data, but then also uh, look at the bigger picture when, when it comes to actually the analysis of the data. I guess just uh, coming back to the, the gender uh, case study. So uh, another example that uh, I heard recently was um, they were analyzing the amount of uh, female CEOs uh, in tech uh, companies. Uh, and the success rate of female CEOs versus male CEOs. Uh, and they saw that actually female CEOs perform much worse than the male CEOs. But when they dug deeper, it turned out that female CEOs are most, more likely than men to accept a CEO role when the company is mm. already going down. Right, so, yeah. uh, so it's really important to, mm. to not just focus. So data is the first thing that's most, most important. Context. But then the context and the looking at the bigger picture and looking at correlations between the different aspects of what you're analyzing is really key. Mm. Mm. I mean, part of our discussion generally, I think you were very strong in saying the importance of human reasoning. Um, yes. as part of this and I think that's a sort of really interesting element of perspective to bring. Sure and uh, that's ob obviously from my background in cognitive science uh, so all that we were studying about is uh, you know the priming and framing so how important uh, uh, understanding of your own biases is so every one of us is biased and every everything we look at we look at it differently than everyone else right uh, so knowing that and remembering that and making sure that these biases don't uh, come across when building the machine le uh, learning systems is, is really important and once again every decision has to be made in a combination of you know, data driven decision plus the human intuition and re reasoning. Okay, um, let's go to the final question and uh, before we uh, open it up to the audience. So if I'm a founder, perhaps I'm an underrepresented group uh, in the audience or maybe even watching this post event, um, what specifically um, can I do to better access funding and investment from the venture capital community and beyond? And I think, Andy, I think you mentioned EF as well. Who are they called? Workspace customer. Do you mind talking a bit about your journey as a way of yeah, illuminating Yeah, Yeah, sure. So, so just for some context, um, Entrepreneur First, EF, um, is a, a company builder. They're an accelerator program. And what that means is that they raise money um, and then they bring 100 people with potential who don't know each other, who are pre-team, pre-idea. So 100 strangers in a room, um, a lot with a more technical background from AI to machine learning, um, and a small portion of people who are like domain experts. So mine was that I'm an expert in product management, right? And um, I got into the program, um, and basically you're in this, it's, it's kind of a crazy program where um, you kind of matchmake and you try and find a co-founder in like the first three months, that's like the goal. 
and then you find a founder, you come up with like an idea, and then you test that idea, then you go to this kind of investment board to see if you can get your first piece of investment before you grow your company. And I was going through that process and I just thought for a second like, this is just not a human experience. This is just not, this is not how the world works. Like, you can't just fabricate a relationship. Like, I'm a, big, I'm a big believer in compound interest, but not only in money, in like relationships that you build as well. And you can't just fabricate a, a relationship with someone and say, I just want to form <laughs> a business with you because I've been on a panel with you and I like you. We get along with each other. Like, that's just not how the world works. Yeah. Like, you have to form deep rooted relationships with the person that you're going to spend potentially the next 10, 20 years of your life building a business with maybe more time than your child or your wife. Like, you need to form a deep relationship with that person to do that. And actually, it's not about fabricating and coming up with just ideas. It's about actually what problems are meaningful to you. Like, what pain points are you experiencing that you've got a unique stance on and a solution to? Or what experiences are your community or people around you that you have unique access to experiencing that you've got a solution to? And it's a very different take on, on entrepreneurship and company building. So I'm glad on the one hand that I had the opportunity to experience it and see it from the inside. And I wrote that blog post about how I turned down 80,000 pounds, that I turned down the money because I actually just wasn't true to who I am. And um, through that, that process, so many other founders who now wanted to go into the program have contacted me where I give a balanced view on what I think about the program, the design flaws, and what's good. And, and even this week, I'll share with you that my friend Yemi got onto the program. So he's going to be joining the next cohort. But at least now, he's got someone and some people that he can reference against to say, to, to understand from the inside how that works. And I think that's really important to understand that each one teach one. Like, if you've been into somewhere, if you've got access to a network, I do actually think it's quite responsible to, to help others up the ladder and help others gain access too. So, so I've had that privilege myself. It didn't work for me, but it could work for someone else. Mm. So I'm not discounting an opportunity just because it didn't work for me. And I think that's equally as important. Mm. Just a final comment before we open to the audience. I was just going to say that I think you touched on two really good points there. And I think one is fundamentally, if you're sitting there and thinking, I don't, what if I don't know anyone? I don't know who to go to. I think it's don't be afraid of practically, if you're looking for funding, to, to reach out to people who either mm. are similar to you and have raised funding Absolutely. or in a similar, you know, they might be in a similar sector, as in they're, they're female or they're black or whatever it might be, and they've raised successful funding or they might be a similar company. Um, and reach out to them and ask them about their experiences. Ultimately, that's how we started raising partners was be very organically because I had so many people asking me how I raised money and mm. where I found it and what my experience was. And, and then beyond that is not being afraid to go out there and, and ask investors what they're looking for mm. and do, doing that research. There's so much Absolutely. information out there, but people can kind of, you just segregate yourself and think, oh, I think that the landscape is like this, or I think that investor thinks this, when actually it could be completely, diff com completely different to that. And actually that's not what they're looking for, and they're looking at this sector or whatever it might be, but you don't know unless you ask. And I'm constantly amazed when I speak to entrepreneurs about, you know, ha have you spoken to any investors yet at all? No, I've not spoken to anyone. Why? I'm too scared to send mm. them anything in case I get it wrong. Mm. And I just, I just, un unless you ask them what they're looking for, you, you're never going to get to the next stage. And I don't think you, people should be afraid of cold outreach and sending an email to people, connecting with them online and adding value or saying, hey, I, re I read that Medium article you wrote, I thought this, this and this, and having Absolutely. contact with them rather than just sitting in an office thinking, well, I can't, you know, I don't know how I'm going to find investment, I don't know what to do. Because just, unless you're out there, you're, you're going to stay not, not, I not knowing what I to completely do. agree with everything that was just shared. And, and even to add to that as well, um, like that, that whole kind of like cold contacting people or meeting people at events, it's still a relationship. Like, forget fundraising. Even if you don't need to fundraise and it's going to come in 6 to 12 to 15 months, strategically, now is the time to build a relationship. Even if it's just to understand a little bit more about what they do, get on their radio and to send like a monthly email just to say, like, just an update on how things are going. You're going to be front of mind when that transaction happens and actually you need to fundraise because they're going to understand the progress you've made today, mm -hmm. the, the highs and lows, and they're going to be responding to your asks if you format your, your monthly email right to say, like, this is the update on products, this is what's happening in the market and new hires, like, these are my asks. People are going to reach out to help you. And because you're taking them along that journey, it's not, in, it's not transactional anymore. Actually, it's a relationship now, you know, and it's very different 
having a relationship with someone rather than coming to them at the point of transaction because I'm just fundraising. Um, so yeah, there's, there's probably a lot more tips that you, you can give. Okay. Like I mean, at, at this point, I'm particularly interested in what the audience has to say. So does anyone have a question? Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I'm not sure if this is a question or a comment, so bear with me. Um, you talked earlier on about kind of the experiences that we've grown up with these biases um, and that actually it's very hard to penetrate those biases sometimes. And I think it's worth us thinking about how can companies... Um, what we can't do is always change the beliefs and attitudes of everyone that works within our companies, whether they be white, middle-class men or anyone else. It's quite hard to challenge biases. How important do you think it is that the system that they're operating within, that the system challenges biases, even if they can't? I think it's, uh, it's very important to answer your question. I think um, at the moment... There is, you know, especially for companies that are very ROI focused, there isn't enough resources allocating, allocated to actually ensuring that these biases are not present. So it's not that you know, everyone in the company probably is very much for uh, doing things in an ethical way. It's just a matter of that their time is limited and has to be allocated towards the most profitable areas of the business. And I think it really has to come from high, higher management to make sure that the, the people that work on these AI projects have a certain amount of time allocated purely to ensuring mm. that the solutions follow the AI uh, ethical approach. Um, I, I would say though, um, I think, I think there, it's important also to, uh, um, to take into consideration the players that are not ethical, right? Because they're, 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 I mean, it's, the industry is full of, of, of people that are you know, in it for not the morals and the better of humanity, but, you know, to make a quick buck. And I think the, the, the question there is how do you make sure that those, uh, those players are introducing this, um, uh, these measures that are actually going to have a cost and, you know, potentially introducing red tape and, and, and um, uh, sh sh immediate term disadvantages to the process. So uh, I think in that perspective, thinking about the, not just the regulation, because also regulation is, is, is playing catch up with technology, introducing other methods that allow industries to self-regulate. Uh, standards are one of the methods that are often efficient. And standards are very interesting because when creating a standard, even though it's the best framework that anyone could follow, if you just give it to somebody, they don't have to use it. People only use it if buyers enforce their suppliers to use it. Mm. So the question is how can you identify areas within industries that allow through osmosis uh, that players that actually have the money and have the buying power to be able to enforce them. In this case with investment, I think it would be important from the suppliers, the startups perspective for the investors to ensure that the companies they're investing on have a certain number of whether it's certifications or minimum requirements that align with uh, um, some requirements that, that, that ensure, in this case, diversity. Uh, but it's a hard one, right? Because we are creating standards, but nobody's going to use them unless it's beneficial for them. And often this just becomes risk aversity, uh, reducing risks or uh, increasing profitability. So you do get stuck in this vicious circle of how do you introduce ethics by force, mm -hmm. right, in a way, uh, which is challenging, yeah. I think my, my one tidbit to add, add to that as well is like, if we think of like systematic companies which have like calculated risk baked into their cultures, we think of companies like Amazon, right? Like Amazon is willing to fail at scale or win at scale. They had this unsuccessful phone called a Fire Phone 160 million dollar investment, it was a failure. But they've also had AWS, they've also had Echo, they've also had all of these areas that they've gone into, Kindle, which actually, on paper, initially as a bookstore, investors never knew that they were gonna go into these areas, and they've won in those areas. Like, if we look at companies like Ernst & Young, EY, um, they have smart futures programs where they dedicate 10% of their recruitment or 5% of their recruitment to just recruiting people from different backgrounds as students. And companies need to do that. They need to have like 5% of budget and resources and people or 10% that they dedicate to just taking risks. And actually, the benefit we're going to get out of it is a learning experience. 
It's not about winning or losing, it's about learning. Okay? And we need to take that, that, that product approach to how we recruit, to how we create pathways to leadership. Just take a risk on 10% of your budget. Start somewhere, start there. At least you've got something dedicated and it's mandated in the culture of how we operate. Hmm. Let's see if we can get more questions in. Ooh. Hi. Okay. Um, okay. It's <laughs> yes. Now. Um, equally, I'm not quite sure whether this is a question or a statement, <coughs> but um, I've got a view in terms of the ethics by force, and I don't think that works because we're human first before we are systems. And if we reflect on, do you remember the pay gap that was happening in the BBC a couple of years ago? And, you know, men were being paid more than women. In my view, I could be wrong, but it's my view. The reason why it became so visible, because the people who populate the boards are middle-class white men. And invariably, their relationships are with women who may reflect them, their mom, their sister, their their cousin, their daughter. And so when we're dealing with the issues of diversity, inclusion, if who you're trying to connect with is not in your world, you're never going to see them. And then on top of that, you can't force it because you can't mandate people to do something. Mm -hmm. I think it happens through the natural humanistic relationship. So, as I said, I'm not quite sure whether it's a question or a statement, but we're human first. Mm. Yeah. And in our humanity, I was a Buddhist for 12 years, mm. and so therefore in our humanity, in relating, you're able to see the nuances of who we are as individuals and as people. And I don't believe that you can mandate by law, by regulation, to do something. If you're not connecting humanistically, I don't think it's going to work. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. I think let's um, take that as an interesting... Uh, yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's, yeah. A, that's a really interesting point. And I, and I agree. Uh, I think uh, in, in fundamentally uh, that is true. And I think it, it has to be a bottom-up. It can't definitely just be a top-bottom. But I think, you know, you mentioned ethics and, you know, specifically by force. I mean, it wasn't uh, literally specifying that. But I think that's, that's an interesting perspective because... Um, ethics in itself, the reason why it's, it's, it's so prevalent in our society is because um, the rule of law is actually a uh, formalized representation of human ethics. And ultimately, uh, a lot of the barristers or, or um, uh, individuals in, in court, uh, like the judge, whenever they uh, make a ruling, uh, say, for example, whether it's criminal law or whether it's and, and this is fully outside of my, of my expertise. Right? I but, did law. So but I think I in, in that perspective, uh, when, when in interacting with a new technology, in this case, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, the reason why the European Union, uh, we're currently working to build this um, uh, 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 draft for the ethical framework that is going to govern is because, well, not just for humans to adhere to that ethics, uh, code of ethics, but for that to be acquired by uh, nation states to then abstract, uh, abstract that into law that then would be enforced. So I completely agree that uh, you know it's impossible to to have uh, uh, ethics by force because that just wouldn't work. It would you know the society would completely uh, uh, explode and implode. But at the same time, it is important to be able to quantify uh, uh, to convert this very very abstract concept in, into a way that can be applied in society. And when it comes to technology. This is often reflected through frameworks, whether it's regulation, standards, or even industry internal processes. So I think, I think that is where the intersection of uh, humanity and applied ethics could come in. But of course, it does require that sort of morality and, and human nature. So I, I, I completely agree with that perspective. Okay, there was a number of questions. That's Hi, um, can I firstly say thank you to all of you. It's been hugely insightful uh, this evening. Um, I think the one thing that I'm kind of hearing, um, we've talked a lot about diversity, we've talked a lot about recruitment, we've talked a lot about AI. Um, what I'm sort of thinking here is that if the AI is only learning from what the humans are feeding into it, the problem isn't just the humans, it's the recruitment process in terms of the attitude of people that organizations are hiring, which is going to constantly reinforce the, the negative decisions. Um, 
have the panel seen any really good products out there um, from an AI perspective that actually helps organizations hire more based on attitude as opposed to technical skills? 100%. Do, do you want to take this or should I? <laughs> Um, I'm just thinking. <laughs> I, mean, um, I, I mean, I have an example. If... I just, just very short, I guess. Yeah, go ahead. Over. So I, I, I strongly think that we, when uh, pre-processing our data to feed into a machine learning system, we should really go by the statistical significance of that data rather than our feel of what we prefer. There being pink flowers or purple because we like purple more than you know. So we should probably. Uh, rather than hiring people based on their attitudes, we should hire people based on their willingness to follow strict rules when it comes to statistical st significance, I would say. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And I think uh, one of the examples actually is uh, the, the all, all good company, Google, um, you know, do no <laughs> evil company. Um, they themselves actually had a, a, a massive uh, a thought leadership piece in, in, in management and recruitment. So they actually have a very interesting blog post for anyone uh, interested, um, where they uh, provide an assessment and an, an analysis of performance of teams, and they quantify what does uh, uh, high performance look like? Uh, what are the, the team interactions that uh, result in better, res uh, 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 that have better results? And in turn uh, to that, that's uh, a lot of the insight that they brought into their internal recruitment processes. I mean, as a software engineer that applies into Google, it feels like all human interaction is caught. And it is because the way that they uh, process it is by optimizing on the performance because they can actually cut the worst uh, 30% and also sacrifice the best 30%. As long as they don't get both sides, they're happy. So there's, a, there's been a lot of use cases there, but I think the, the hard question is basically back into, into bias. They're introducing all these algorithms. How do we know that it's not reinforcing societal biases that are currently inherent in, as you say, attitudes? Because often what is gonna allow Google to outperform the other tech giants, it may or may not be diversity, but to what extent can we ensure that they're following practices that are going to have better impact in the long term um, in terms of diversity and even further stuff. Yeah. And that addresses again the question of, you know, will VC uh, funds ever be fair? Well, how can we try to ensure that if what optimizes them is not going to be what we want, right? Mm. I mean, so I don't... Just, just a quick, quick... Yeah, quick, final one. Quick, quick, yeah, quick. real quick. Um, there's a <laughs> software called Applied. It's beapplied.com um, by a founder called Kate Glazebrook. Um, we haven't invested in her. I haven't used the software, so I haven't got an opinion formed on it. But um, I have heard it recommended a number of times, so it's worth checking it out. Thank you. Mm. Um, I don't know about everyone else, but I'm quite hungry. Um, <laughs> and certainly I know there is a great team outside um, ready to serve everyone. Um, but I think first things first, I'd like to request that everyone give the panel a big round of applause.